our first speaker, <clears throat> Ryan Kalaji, and he's back. We're going to be talking about low input land, ma <coughs> land management, <coughs> excuse me, and using native plants when possible. Ryan, welcome back. All right, folks, I don't have three paragraphs prepared today like I did on Wednesday, but I do have some pictures of the farm, and I was told to just wing it. So Hey, can I, can I interrupt you one time? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. One thing I forgot, the next, the break after this, am I right? The break after this, the hog's going to be down here? Let's see. Let me make sure. 915? Yes. At 9.15, the smoker is going to be down here, right outside. There's going to be one opportunity if you want to go look at a whole hog that's been smoked all last night. That's going to be for lunch today. One opportunity to take a look at it, then it's going to be closed up. It's going to be taken in here and start getting ready and being pulled and everything for lunch. All right, Ryan, thank you. Well, now I'm more interested in that hog than in about what I'm about to speak about. <laughs> all right, so... Uh, this photo here is from May of 2015, and this is where we had done a no-till planting of corn, sunflower, soybeans, sunflower, soybeans, sunflower, corn. And uh, let's see if I can, all right, this is the next spring, and you can already see some of these trees coming up. This is our, our first installation of what we're now doing as, as kind of a, you know, a permaculture. So what we have are rows of rhubarb with fruit trees in the, the, the rhubarb patch. So the, as the fruit trees you know, bud out and leave out in the spring, the rhubarb has already had a chance to grow up. So we're in Wisconsin, and we're picking our first crop of rhubarb sometime in the last week of May or the first week of June. So these are two things. They're not necessarily companion crops, but they do all right together because of the, the, the seasonal difference as to when they, you know, rhubarb's already starting to come out of the ground as soon as it's, it's thaw. There is my lovely wife with our Icelandic sheep. This is also 2016, I believe. We don't have the sheep anymore because of issues with profitability. Sheep are cute, you know, it's, it's great having around, but at some point you gotta decide is the time in, that you're gonna invest in this particular uh, adventure, is it worth it? So we no longer have the sheep. They were fun, they did a good job of keeping down, you know, invasives and whatnot. This is the, the, the field that you were looking at here. Let's, so this is 2015, and this is now. So I don't know what I'm doing, so th don't, don't go home and, and attempt to recreate this, say, Ryan told me, okay, because I didn't know that this was going to happen, and I don't know exactly how it happened, but the trees that, that came up in our, our no-till system, they populated really good. You can see that there is quite the variety where, you know, from looking up above the drone video that was playing uh, yesterday, that it does look more of a mono culture of, you know, mostly just box elders, but right here you can see there's birch, poplar, box elder, and probably can't see it in you know where I'm standing by my feet there's actually uh, some red maples that are starting to come in here is a frontage of the road where we kept these pigs in this little pen for a year and they turned this sod into into dirt which I know is against the five principles but you do what you got to do all right well let's and this is that same patch. 
So this is one spring. This is the, the next, well, this is actually right now. So it's, we planted all this this spring, and this is what it looks like now. And we've gone, we've gone uh, from the just rhubarb and fruit trees to now we've actually added, you can't quite see it, but there's oregano planted in between the rhubarb. There is elderberry planted in between the fruit trees. So now we have two crops of ground cover that are going to come up right away in the spring, which are your oregano and your rhubarb, which as long as you keep them harvested, they'll just keep producing. The fruit trees are later to come in. The elderberry, which is kind of invasive, but it is a native plant, that is shade tolerant. So 15 years from now, 20 years from now, as these fruit trees mature and start to shade everything out, the elderberry still should do all right, and seasonally, the rhubarb and oregano should still be able to give you a spring crop. So we're not just, not just doubling up, we're trying to, trying to triple up, we're trying to really maximize each square footage, each square foot that we have in our, our perennial installations. Also in that center row, we have strawberries going in, so strawberries aren't necessarily something that I want to get into. We've had strawberries, they're, they're kind of a pain, but got some free space, put something in there, keep the ground. Not that I don't like the five principles, just that sometimes I... All right, so this is a little experimental, uh, kind of an herb patch here. We've got sorrel, we've got a bunch of different balms, and in the, the, the time that we were trying to get the, this herb patch going, we decided to plant basil in with our herbs. So the basil's not going to come back, and it just made this really, really dense planting. And this, I believe, is actually going to be scalable for us, where we're going to be planting the, the sages, the balms, and the sorrel in with other crops to get them going. And, you know, the basil's not coming back next year. And then you'll have, you know, a, a variety of, of herbs. Also, there's a row of chives in there. And just off to the corner are hollyhocks and dianthus, maybe? Talk a little bit about raising chicks and, and hatching chickens, which are not necessarily uh, low input because feed's expensive, but if you're hatching out your own eggs and you have a surplus of eggs, instead of just feeding them to the pigs or giving them away, you can set up your incubator and you know, get in a rotation of hatching out your, you know, to add a little value to, to the eggs that you have available. Here's an excellent one, Muscovy ducks. If you're looking for something that can survive on its own, a uh, Muscovy duck isn't actually um, g genetically a duck. It's a South American waterfowl. So these are not, Muscovies have not been selectively bred for production characteristics. They are wild. That hen will come and bite your face. I mean, if you pick up one of them babies, she'll, she's going to come after you. And she hatched that brood out. I mean, those are all her from one brood that she hatched out, and those babies will follow around all over the farm. Of course, you've got to deal with predation, but of all the, the fowl that we've had on the farm, Muscovy ducks are definitely what we'd recommend to people that want a free range and they want something that will take care of themselves, breed on their own, raise their own young, and actually produce... Uh, the males actually get fairly big and produce quite a bit of meat. This is ugly, all right, so don't judge. But this is our first experience with winter farrowing. This little hut here was built on a, a, a couple of oak trees that I had cut down threw some plywood up over it, screwed the plywood to, the, to a, a log there, threw some hay on that. This picture is in January in Wisconsin. Two sows crawled in there, farrowed together, and it was 20 below. All right, not exactly a lot of wind chill on this side of the, the woods, but they raised out 
16 piglets between the two of them in 20 below weather. So there's no heat lamp, there's no assisting, there's no crawling in there with two sows that have babies and trying to assist because they're, you might get killed, but this was a, an aha moment for us where we realized that we don't need to be trying to keep to this rigid schedule of, you know, we have to only breed during certain months of the year because if we're farrowing outside in the woods or on pasture that these piglets are going to die. Everyone's telling us, oh, your piglets are going to die out there. These girls did great, and, and we're like, well, let's, let's just breed year-round and, and try and maximize the amount of uh, litters that we can have every year. Also, we then have a steady supply of piglets where it's not just such a rush of, you know, here's all of your piglets in the spring and then a whole bunch of piglets in the fall, and what do you do with 100, 150 piglets in the fall when you don't have a market? Well, we found out, we took them down to Equity Livestock Exchange, and they sent us a check for 750 a piglet. You know, so that, that was another aha moment where you're better off just giving them away. Well, we got to add some cuteness because the, the wife was helping me put this together. Small pigs can be used in sensitive plantations, especially where you have a perennial crop that's deep-rooted, that these piglets will go down these center rows where that dirt is soft, and, and they'll go th through and turn that all up. They do wreck your rhubarb a little bit. I believe this is a, would be a second picking, so we've already went through, picked it once. We filled all of our orders. We didn't have any more order, orders left, and we decided, well, let's, let's, uh, let's see what happens if we turn some piglets loose in there. Innovation is a key to any small farm. I, not all of you are small farmers, but if you're getting going, you always have to be looking to, you know, not, not just to um, you know, one-up yourself. Whatever you did last year, that worked, okay? You might be successful in, in all of those ventures you had last year, but you're never going to get better without attempting something new to, you know, how do I make sure I keep the weeds down in my rhubarb? Let's turn some little piglets loose and see if they can do it for me. So, I'm not proud of this. That, the green you see there is a Siberian pea berry, which is now invasive or considered invasive. We haven't experienced that, but the Siberian pea berry is a hardy perennial that, you know, it's Siberian, so it, it'll grow in Wisconsin, no problem. But it does produce an actual, like a, a, a pea pod and they taste like, like soybeans, like if you crack it open and eat it. So it's, it's one of the things that was brought over with the, the uh, Eastern European immigrants that they established it as a food source for themselves, but now would work as not just for, for native, but if you were planting this as a hedgerow for your, for your chickens or your ducks, that they'd be able to eat this seasonally. I don't know. I've, bird eggs, but they decided to make a little nest there right, right in our, our little pea berry patch. Rhubarb, so here we are with a weekend's harvest of rhubarb. And like I was saying before, we're yielding a pound of rhubarb per square foot. And if we're wholesaling this at $2 a pound, we're getting $2 a square foot in our rhubarb plantations. It did take a little bit to establish a market for this and get to the point where you know, we can actually pick a pickup truck load of this and take it to someone else. And we are working on other available markets for juice because it's obviously difficult for, you take this to a winery and they've got to press this out and go through all that where you could value add this and it'd be easier to ship the juice. And I've done the research on this. There is you could, you could add 100,000 acres of rhubarb in the United States and there would still be space for more rhubarb to be grown as long as you're turning this into juice. Because there is, I, I, I worked over the road, I hauled lots of stuff in the back of a refrigerated trailer. One of the things I was hauling around was juice concentrate. 
we've had breweries approach us about adding this to their, you know, they make a summer shandy, and what they're using is a, like a citrus. And they have to source this citrus juice or citrus flavor somewhere else where here you could be growing this locally and providing the same exact product and have it not be grown out in, in California. Nothing against anyone from California? California? Wisconsin, so I mean, they, they've, they're now the dairy state, so I've you know, got a sore spot about this. This was not seeded. We did not seed this. This is native seed bank. And after you, you take your hogs and run through an area that this blew my mind. This came up and I'm just like, how? You know, why? You know, where did, you know, how long does clover seed persist I in the ground and where does it all come from? So this is something that I would, I'd like someone smarter than me to tell me about, you know, how this happened. But this is an excellent example of how you can till soil and come out the other side with something that is much more beneficial than the, the ragweed and goldenrod that was in here. Are you with the county? So we imported pigs and we've, we do these uh, red wattle, it's a rare breed of pig and we've also imported into the state of Wisconsin uh, mule foots and uh, Chinese meishan and Wisconsin has a a testing that is different than any other state. So you, you call the, to buy your hog, you have them get a hold of their, their vet, they fill out a certificate of veterinarian inspection, they call the state of Wisconsin to make sure it's done right, send it in, and then we get this in the mail. All right, then they come out to our farm and put us under quarantine, all right, and they say, bad Ryan, you know, do better next time. So just be aware that if you're moving pigs from state to state, that it is on you to make sure that that stuff is done correctly, regardless of what the vet in the other, other state said. You get on the phone, you call your state veterinary, you call them, get them on a conference call and be like, hey, is all this stuff done correctly? We brought pigs to Virginia this time, but uh, last year we brought them to West Virginia, which requires a blood test for brucellosis and pseudorabies. So our vet had to come out and we we're sticking these pigs in the neck to draw blood to send it out and obviously that raises the cost of, of taking pigs to West Virginia. Maybe that's why they were calling me in Wisconsin trying to get someone to import them for them. Um, box elder. So this is a, a fast growing tree in Wisconsin that the the pigs can't really, really kill off. And we have this inoculated with oyster mushrooms. Oysters are not what I would recommend. They're the, they're the easiest to start with, and obviously they grow on just about everything, box elder, poplar, maple, or, maple, or really they will grow anywhere, but they go bad very quickly. These look fresh, but some of these, the bigger mushrooms here, let's try the pointer out. I haven't tried that out. Pointer. Okay, there you go. So that right there, they're all fanned out. There's going to be bugs in there. And these are all, all these came up within the past 48 hours. So this is a, a very time sensitive um, product that if you're going to start growing oyster mushrooms outside on these logs that you really have to be mindful of when your rain is coming, when the heat, you know, it's getting warm and cold, which triggers the mushrooms to come out. And you gotta have a market for them immediately because they don't keep in the refrigerator very well. Oh, my lovely wife again, I believe this is 28, 18 or 19. So if we go all the way back to the beginning and show, you know, that was, the field was fallow for a couple of years, we did the no-till and then the spring. So in just a couple of years that it, it went from uh, corn and beans rotation that the, the, the neighbor had been renting the property, spraying chemicals to sooting fallow, then we did the, the no-till seeding and explosion of, of all kinds of neat stuff there.
my phone has lots of pictures of uh, animal poop. <laughs> so if you're, if you're wondering how to, how to make your farm better and be more efficient, you know, get out there and look at some poop. You know, this is, this is pig poop, all right? And it's, you can pick through this and there is an incredible amount of, of forages in this. Now, if you're feeding them just grain, it's gonna be a lot different color and it's going to have a lot different consistency. Are your pigs able to digest grasses? Not exactly. I mean, I can't go grab a handful of gra ga grass and eat it. You know, their pigs are monogastric like we are. They're not a rumin ruminant. But it does fill them up, and it does keep them more content. And we've noticed that if, as long as we're providing a regular grain ration for our pigs, that... The pigs on pasture do grow faster, and they do have a, a larger frame in maturity. So the, the adult red wattle hogs, most people are like, you know, five, six hundred pounds, they'll tell you. Get. We've got sows that are close to a thousand and, and a boar that was well over a thousand pounds. And is that from the grain we're feeding it? I don't think so. I think it's from them having a, a diverse, you know, something to fill their gut so they're not out constantly looking for grain. So <clears throat> I know that uh, uh, Russ Wilson was talking about uh, machinery costs and upkeep. So we rented this for a week, and, and I'll, I'll forward it. And uh, I don't know how well you can see that. There is a way back in there, that's the... That's the bulldozer. We got a driveway permit here, and there's a, there's a creek just, just off to the, so it's uh, you know, off, to, off here. So we're, we've got our 75-foot setback, and when we got the permit for this, we had the Army Corps of Engineers, we had the DNR, we had, you know, we had a parade going on of all these people just to give me the driveway permit. I get the bulldozer and do this, and they come shut me down, and they say, well, that, that's not what we thought you were going to do. And I'm like, well, <laughs> it's a driveway. What do you guys expect? So a little bit of arguing over that. This is a good example of the type of soils that we have in Wisconsin. This is um, what they call glacial till. So in, in this particular spot on the farm, you have this very fine sand with a, with a, a pretty dark sandy loam topsoil, which is about six to eight inches on it. But if you go up on the other field that we actually have a darker, heavier soil, which is more clay, and under that is actually layers of, of uh, a coarse sand and a heavy gravel. So, you know, you don't, you don't have to travel far in Wisconsin from field to field to find different soil types. $2,500 for the week. If you need a bulldozer, go out and rent it and, and make sure you get someone that lets you rent it by the week and not by the hour because I put 70 hours on this thing and uh, it felt like I had kidney stones the next day because uh, I put some serious hours in that thing. We actually put about $500 worth of fuel through it. But to, to hire someone to come out and do this would have been an incredible amount to have uh, nearly a thousand feet of driveway put in, plus all the, the earth that was moved, oh, wrong way, the earth that was moved to, to do this, because you can see I cut, there is a couple different hills running through here, and there's actually 35 feet of elevation change between where I'm standing and just on the other side of that bulldozer. So I moved quite a bit of dirt, and I thought that was a pretty good deal to just rent it. The next picture is going to explain this. You can't get raspberries like this in, in depleted soil. Get yourself a semi-load of hardwood sawdust. This was delivered for $1,200. And if, if this was a while ago, but if you're talking about a, you know, a ton of fertilizer now, compare that to you know, I don't know what he had on there, 40, you know, I don't know if he got 40,000 pounds of hardwood sawdust, and I'm, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know the nutrient composition of, of all that sawdust there, 
but it did something. And, and the raspberries, you can go on our Facebook, we're just telling people, hey, come get raspberries, we're going to be out of town. And they are persistent producers of these huge berries because we've layered six to eight inches of that hardwood sawdust, which has kept down pretty much everything but the raspberries. So sometimes investing in a little uh, soil amendment like this, even though that, that didn't cover a very big area, I'm hoping that there will be nutrients in those soil for, for years from doing this. So this is, this is the, the rhubarb patch from the, the very beginning. Okay, I don't know if this is going to work here. Okay, can I go back? I'm going to get seasick doing this here. Okay, so 2016, I, I believe. I don't know how to put slides together, so I, I probably could have done, done a better job. So this is 19? So three, three years went from bare dirt to, I don't know if this was producing a, a pound per square foot at the time, but just in three years, you can turn, in, instead of you know, conventionally growing anything else, put in some perennials, put down your wood mulch, and this has been producing like this for the, you know, the past three or four years, and I would guess that it will produce well into the future, where low input, well, now I'm into no input. Just go out there and, and, and grab handfuls of cash you know, every time I go into the garden. Muscovy ducks, they will lay and sit anywhere, and they do a great job of it. Just don't try and pet her while she's there. She's this is a much better mushroom to grow. Uh, oak logs, and this is a, a cold weather variety of shiitake mushroom. They don't get as buggy as quick, and they, they last a lot longer in the refrigerator. They dry and rehydrate very well. And you know, when they're out of season, if you're able to grow them, you can get $15, $16 a pound for these, these mushrooms. So. Don't be afraid to cut your trees down and do something other than turn them into firewood. So this is down by the, the creek, and I put this in there because this is why my wife and I are, are, are conservationists. Not necessarily, you know, regen farmers specifically, but this right here, I could, stand, I could stand there down there by the creek and look at this all day long. This makes me very happy to see this. And there's not enough people out there that are willing to you know, leave parts of their land. Our county is a wonderful county to live in, but there's a lot of zoning restrictions on what you can do. But I know in other parts of the con country that people would be in there cutting these trees down and trying to use this to, you know, as an income, a, a revenue stream. We also roast our own coffee. This isn't necessarily regenerative related, but it's related to being innovative and, and creating other revenue streams. This isn't creating a revenue stream. This is just, now we don't have to go out and buy expensive coffee. We can source green beans from anywhere around the world and have gourmet coffee every morning. So it's not necessarily about making money, sometimes it's about you know, coming up with ways of saving money. This here is my own proprietary maple tapping system. All right? If you can see this, that is a quarter inch oxygen hose. So, you know, people that would have oxygen tanks in their home that they have this, this oxygen hose and it has a kind of a, because it's quarter inch, it's fairly rigid and you can put a, what would it be, 60 fourths, whatever one size is less than a quarter inch, you drill that in there and that is 
literally friction fit that you, you, you can twist it in there and jam it in that tiny little hole. You don't even need a hanger for your bag. You just knock the sticks out of the way, lay an empty bag there, put a stick on it, and then the whatever the science is behind how water works, that it will just fill that, that bag up. So we were able to do hundreds of taps for very, very little input on this. In fact, we did so many taps that we didn't tap maple trees for a couple of years. This would be our second rhubarb installation, but it turned out to be a nursery for a different planting. So you have, I don't know, four or five hundred plants in here, and if you were to go out and source rhubarb, you know, they'll sell you this little dry crown, and it costs you ten bucks or five bucks, and, and they, it's not very viable. Growing your own nursery stock is very important to any small farm or anyone that's trying to diversify their, their property with, with other types of crops. The money's in the propagation. You've got to learn how to either collect your own seed, you know, make your own cuttings. Rhubarb works great for us because it's very hard to kill. And, you know, I've failed at growing a lot of other things. Rhubarb is something that I can, I can be successful with, so... Red wattle pork chop. <clears throat> so I got a lot of hate on Facebook when I started posting this picture of my pork chop around, and people are like, well, some people are like, well, that's not a red wattle pork chop, or, or that's not even pork. But I assure you, that is a, a pork chop. One thing I want to talk about is finishing a hog. People, ever, everyone knows that you got to finish your steer, that it, it isn't magic to get get that fat right, you know, to get those cuts right. That once it, once it starts the plateau, you still gotta finish that animal. This is a one-year-old hog that the hanging weight was 300 pounds. Everyone's say, well, you lost 15% in fat. Well, but I gained more than 15% in awesome right there. You know, I, I can invite my, my in-laws over and throw those on the grill and, and uh, they'll be like, man, this Jersey beef is great. No joke, I, I told my in-laws we were eating our Jersey steers and, and they, didn't, they didn't catch on. <laughs> this is Depression Era. That is my, in the picture, that is my great uncle. So that would be my mother's grandfather's brother standing right there with his red hogs. And the irony of all this is they, these guys right here, this picture right here, reminds me so much of a red wattle hog. But these were, these were Jersey Duroc's. Because you know, back then the, the Jersey and the, the red Jersey and the Duroc were still separate registries. And it's amazing how much the old style pig still had that, the deep body, the long legs. They weren't all, all muscled out. And one of the reasons we like the red wattles is they haven't been selectively bred for production characteristics. They still retain all of those, the natural instincts that they, they can farrow outside. We've, we haven't had to pull a piglet in hundreds of litters. You know, who can, you know, anyone with a commercial breed or show breed, you know, you go on Facebook and they're all talking about, oh, I'm pulling piglets. If she, if she doesn't have the next piglet within 15 minutes, go in there and start fishing around for it wrong. Heritage breeds really are the, the low input. You know, if you're going to be raising pigs and you want to be more hands off, find something that breeds naturally, farrows naturally, and can take care of itself out in, in the environment. So I don't know if he cut these right. I mean, this particular butcher, he's always got an opening because he, he has a hard time keeping staff around. But I like going there because I can call them up tomorrow and still get a hog in. But more red wattle pork. And it, it looks like beef, it eats like beef. Here she is out there m making a nest, crunching up trees, throw her a little bit of hay. She had these in the rain in 40 degrees. 
you know so this is a high percentage clover alfalfa baleage it's organic we don't necessarily look for organic but it just happened that that the guy that we buy for is a certified organic and he he wraps it correctly he cuts it correctly this stuff is delicious it smells delicious I would almost eat this that's my pigs eating a bale of hay I mean they're chewing on that thing like like rats like rats on a corn cob so if you've if you've got pigs through the winter and they're used to having forage this uh, high moisture wrap baleage really is, I figured it out, they might be consuming a pound of this a day. So an $85, $85 $100 bale, might have been 1,200 pounds. It's not all that much input, and it gives them something to do. You know, they're not out there testing the fence. They're not out wrecking their buildings. When they want to chew on something, they've got a, a delicious bale of haylage. Did we already see this photo already? The, the rhubarb with the fruit trees and the elderberry? That's all right. We'll, we'll go. All right. So here is that patch again, but you can see that we have these uh, perennial flowers. So this is new this year, that to diversify our revenue stream, we're getting into propagating perennial flowers. And this is, has high traffic road frontage. So now everyone that drives by is always seeing this. They drive by, they're like, oh, that's, that's really neat. They stop over, they start walking through our garden. You know, but perennial flowers. You buy a couple from wherever you're getting from. Make sure you get the, don't get the cultivars, get the actual, you know, like, like mums. You don't want the, you don't want the cultivar mums, you want the hardy garden mums because they're going to be, you know, a, persistent and you're going to be able to divide them. You can see some violets in there which are kind of invasive in, in the, the back. Is that it? Uh oh. Ran out of photos again. How far are we in? Well, let me talk about what makes what makes someone successful? I come from a, a long line of people that are overachievers, workaholics. My, my older brother is a, a football coach for the University of Wisconsin, uh, Madison, the Badgers. He's a strength and conditioning coach. And he tells people, you know, when you're working out, if you don't puke, you didn't work out right. So if you're out there, if, you, if you've got a project going on and you're out there and you're like, oh, it's kind of hot out, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave this till tomorrow, well, you obviously don't want to be very successful. A professional attitude is going to make you successful. So anything that you do, like this little tiny bed of, of, um, of herbs there, I may have been more ambitious, I may have wanted a bigger bed, but... I made sure that when I was building it, that I was building it and always maintaining the same level of awesomeness as I'm doing everything. And when it's time, you know, I'm tired to go in, I can leave what I have and it's finished. It's not half finished when I walk away. So when you're, whenever you're doing anything, always, like the red wattle pigs, I did lots of research before I bought any pigs. I tracked down every breeder that I could, talked to every breeder that I could, got pictures of their farms. We put on, you know, we, we drove down to North Carolina for our first boar all the way from Wisconsin just to make sure that we had the genetic diversity that we wanted to start our herd. All right, uh, shameless self-promotion. Like me on Facebook, go to YouTube, Epic Nature LLC, watch me electrocute myself in my hog fencing video. You know, I, I talked about it. I talked. <laughs> you can hear the snap. I just, just hear it in my head it makes me want to laugh. I mean, it's not funny, but I laugh. <laughs> the problem is it was on a, a small, lots of jewels on a small, pe small pen. So it, 
made my day. So I talked about this on Wednesday about, uh, you know, we're all here together. You know, we, we, all have, we all have different farms, but we have the same, same general idea of, of what we want out of not just our property, but out of life. So we should all be supporting each other. And um, they didn't do it this year, but I think that there should be a list of, you know, a YouTube channel is the, it's not a huge revenue stream, but it's the easiest way for everyone in here to not just, um, not just reach other people, but to catalog what you're doing. To be out there taking a couple pictures all the time, taping, taking a couple videos, end of every month, put together what you've done that month, month, put it out on YouTube, and that way you can go back and say, oh, I, I remember that now, instead of people don't always take the time to write stuff down. I haven't written anything down in 10 years. Yeah, I'm lost. So without the, a, a video record of it, you know, you don't have something to go back and be like, oh yeah, now I remember why I did that or how I did that. But there should be a list of everyone's YouTube channels. So when we come down here, we can all subscribe to everyone's YouTube channels, get everyone to 1,000 subscribers so we can start monetizing the few people that actually do watch our, our stupid videos. You know, so hopefully next year we can get a list, you know, where everyone can be like, all right, let's, let's all together get everyone to that point where we can monetize you know, what we're doing on the farm. Sure. I mean, I can talk about, <laughs> want to talk about fishing, hunting? <laughs> you touched briefly on finishing off the red wallers. What is that process? Can you give us the details of that? No. Okay. It's, it's seasonal. Okay. It's, it's, it's a geographical, you know, that, that everyone is going to have a different, you know, I talk a little about biodiversity before and, you know, there's not a whole lot of oak trees growing, growing in there right now, but the summer hogs are going to be finishing on clover, where winter hogs are going to be finishing on the baleage. You know, in, in southern states where you have large, large crops of, of acorns or, or pecans or, or whatever it is, that you're going to be finishing your hogs on something. There is a study that I know of where they're using tannins to increase the IMF. So the, 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 the intermuscular fat content is directly related to something out of a, a, a byproduct from, from pecans. So I, sorry I don't have that for you, but, but you probably can, can Google that, and that is something that I know that the, the Embor, Mangalitsa, the, I don't know if you're familiar with this, it's the, the Woolly Pig Breeders Association, that they've been promoting this because Mangalitsa is already a really fat hog so they have, to, they have to market in a certain way because, I mean, we've had Mangalisa pork chops and they're half fat. So you've you got to be able to market your fat in a way or work in getting it more intermuscular than just, you know, three inches of fat cap. Did I answer your question? How, how, do, you, how do you finish a hog? Yeah. I would say time. That's the, that's the biggest factor is you've got to let that pig get get old enough to where it reaches maturity, where it's not just in that, that phase of fast growth, that it actually gets to you know, 9, 10, 12 months, depending on the breed, where it hits a more maturity, where it can kind of develop, develop a little bit more muscle. The frame stops getting longer. Red wattles have a very large frame. That's why we got, you know, we had customers that were like, man, these things have tiny pork chops and no hams on them because they are a leggier animal. They need a little bit longer, they need you know, a little bit heavier carcass weight to get the same size pork chops. So I guess my question would be, there's nothing specific in the last two weeks to month that you make sure to do before taking them to process? I would in fact say don't do. Okay. Don't, don't change what you're doing at the end. Okay. Just, just give them time. Give them a quality feed the entire time. If you want to finish them on, on acorns, I, I've heard that it gives a, a nutty flavor, but if you don't know what you're doing, you could overdo it, and now you have a hog that tastes 
overly nutty and people aren't expecting that where they're expecting more of a, a regular you know, corn fed type pork. Thank you. We got one right, right here. Yep. Okay, um, I think you're right on with the YouTube. Um, you know, there's just so much information out there. If YouTube would have been around years ago, you could have found anything you want. Uh, you know, we didn't have that 30 years ago, 40 years ago. You know, you, you just, now you can look up anything, find how to take apart anything, how to fix anything, how to do anything. But YouTube is just so, it's just so good that everything's there, you know, anything you want. And, uh, you know, I, I watched your videos last night. I seen you get that by the fence and, and uh, it, you know. It's, Son of a. <laughs> but. Uh, I didn't even swear it's edited, but I didn't actually swear. Just well, it's, um, you know, my daughter-in-law's got one and, and you know, it's it just, it, it's amazing what, and some of these bigger farms, they're actually, I think the bigger farms with millions and millions of subscribers I think they're making more off their YouTube channels than they are off their their farming operations. Um, right. It, it's amazing what it can do. Uh, what I mention it for is that, you know, innovation is is what's going to keep the the small farmer in business, and I think that YouTube is a a great place for you to get, you know, them them little little nuggets, you know, to be to be finding people that are doing what you're doing if you're. You know, if you're on YouTube or, or whatever social media, that you should always be trying to network, not just with yeah. like-minded people, but definitely seek out the like-minded people so that, you know, you can share and, you know, we're all going to succeed. You know, if, if one of us succeeds, then that can help all of us succeed, and we should be out there really trying to, to, to keep that, that networking active. Yeah, that's what I was going to say next was is the power of networking is... The power of networking is so good. A lot of people say, especially say, well, I ain't got time for YouTube or I'm not computer illiterate, you know, or whatever. Uh, just even exchanging phone numbers, talking on the phone with people. Um, the power of networking is, is phenomenal. Questions, comments, concerns, uh, opinions about what I've said, I mean, Challenge me. Challenge yourself. Challenge the, your peer group. You know, don't be afraid to be out there asking tough questions of other people because that's the only way that you're going to get better. That's the only way you're going to make someone else better. I mean, I don't know. I don't know half the stuff that that is going on on my farm. I just know that it, it's growing good and it looks green, and you know that's that's a measure of success. I would like to know you know more about the science and stuff like that. Um, I would like to point out there's a, there's a study by the University of Wisconsin. There's a 15-year mulch study of uh, orchards, uh, fruit and nut, nut orchards, where they were actually testing for uh, nutrient runoff and nutrient leaching from mulch. And they actually found that excessive amounts of mulching can actually cause nutrient runoff the same as other fertilizers, which I, I found interesting. So, I mean, there's, there's nuggets out there and a lot of different things if you're just willing to take the time and look. Well, my question was, is when you put that hardwood mulch down, did you need to add lime or something to it to counteract the acid in the wood? I hope I didn't need to add lime, because I didn't. So, I mean, it, the, the berries, the, the raspberries loved it. The, the weeds didn't. So maybe there's something to that. We've, we've sourced some uh, green chopped, wood chips so it's uh it's going to be stuff that the power line company has has removed and it's mostly pine and everyone's like don't put that on there because it still has to do the uh i don't know anaerobic or, or whatever there's it's it's got to decompose and we found that the green stuff actually works better for keeping down weeds because of the the it's so hot that it you just got to make sure that you don't put it close enough to the what you have planted that it's going to kill your perennials Other questions? I did the best I could. There's one over there. Uh, so I've bought 
support from a lady that would use uh, spent brewery um, grains to feed her hogs. Do you have any experience with that or knowledge on that process? This is actually a, a very common question that, that people ask on, on social media, and there is a huge difference between dried distiller's grains and spent brewery waste. Spent brewery waste is all fiber. There is some protein in there, but it is, it is not something that a pig can easily digest. And I believe that they recommend that you only keep it to 10% of your feed. So if you're going to your brewery and they want you to take you know, these huge totes of their spent grain and you only have three hogs, and you can only feed one pound of this per hog per day, you're gonna have flies, you're gonna have nastiness, you're gonna have a huge mess on your hands. Whereas dried distiller grains is corn from, from uh, ethanol plants, which is a high protein, low fiber, which is I kind of ideal for hogs, but also they recommend only maybe 25% of the protein that they get come from that, because that will flavor, your, that will flavor your, your hog also. So there's, there's a lot of different things that, that people need to research when they're, when they're looking into sourcing alternate feed sources for their pigs. The, the brewery grains, I would say leave that for the, the dairy producers, anyone that's got a TMR mixer where they can use that high fiber, mix it in with their other rations and feed that out that way where you'd need 100 hogs you know, to feed out 100 pounds of it. You know, and, and they're not gonna go there and be like, okay, you know, can, I, can I have a couple cups of, of spent grain from my hogs? They're, they're not gonna be interested in that. Thank you. Anybody else? Keep going. There we go. So, what is your mixture that you're feeding? Um, like, what are you sourcing, or is it just a general pig feeder, or are you making your the, own? The corn that we get is locally sourced, and it is a conventionally. So it's 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 not non-GMO. It's still a hybrid seed but it's just that they use cultivation as opposed to herbicides or pesticides. So it's, a, it's what we would consider the best available option for feed, that we so source it from a local, a local grain bin. We take our gravity wagon down there, get 150 bushels of it, and then we take it to a local mill where they custom grind it, and then they add, we like to use a, a, a diverse protein, which it's not just soybean meal, we use soybean meal, we use linseed meal, canola meal, and uh, sunflower meal to get a more diverse uh, am amino acid complex that where soybeans are really high in the, the lysine. There's another study that I, I've been reading a lot of that it wasn't, they didn't do the actual study, they just compiled a whole bunch of, of information from all these other university studies that showed that low protein diets for hogs actually can work out as long as you've supplemented the amino acids. So our, our base mix that we feed to everything is a 12% protein. And when I tell people that, they're like, how can you grow a hog on 12% protein? Well, number one, they don't need the extra amino acids and protein to support a healthy immune system because they're out on pasture, which is in this study also that you know, the, the health of your animal is, is, is directly connected to the rate of gain and what you need in your feed. So it's, it's, a, it's a custom mix and we do use as much barley as we can source locally, but sometimes you can't get barley, so sometimes there's no barley in the mix, sometimes there's 25%. Um, if, we could, if we could source it, we probably would use even higher, you know, 50% 50 50 barley. I had a question on when you get food from a like a food processing plant and you take it to your farm, the inspector of that food processing plant is supposed to come to your farm to see how you handle it and how you, you know, check on spoilage and things of that nature, sickness, I guess, to your animals. Is there a place that you sign up? I mean, do you just go ahead and call your local health department 
and let them know you're doing that or is there what what have you seen we refuse to feed any food waste bakery anything we want to keep our diet as consistent as possible and we also don't want to have the mess that it creates that if you're constantly bringing in all this different stuff and and pouring it out in your your pen that you're just going to you're going to have with a real mess you're going to have flies and 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 just it's it's going to become a problem and a lot of people all they do is source food waste and if you had let's say you're in Washington and you're next to a uh, fruit processing facility and you're getting fruit culls okay fruit culls I mean I'll eat fruit culls okay so if if I'll eat it then I can feed it to my pigs because I know that they're going to eat it up but old moldy bread and donuts and stuff I mean I might eat a moldy donut once in a while but not regularly <laughs> So I, I, I don't know that. I just know that if you're feeding any sort of uh, animal protein that it has to be cooked. And you also, in Wisconsin, you have to say if you're feeding food waste when you, when you take that animal to be processed. Did I answer your question? I'm terrible at answering people's questions. I just get talking about whatever. Doing a good job. Next, anybody? Uh, here back go. here. Going back to when you put the piglets in the rhubarb patch, did they not eat rhubarb at all? They ate the weeds, but not rhubarb? Well, the, the rhubarb is incredibly sour. I don't know if you've eaten a lot of rhubarb. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to, to choke down a bunch of that. And the, the rhubarb plant itself is very high in, I believe it's called oxalic acid, which makes the leaves incredibly bitter. That's why I've been successful at growing rhubarb, because nothing eats it. So, I have, a, I have a question about, have you ever heard or had any experience with feeding, I've heard fresh cow poop has something, an amino acid that pigs use and rarely get. Is that a myth? Is that something you have experience with? I do know that when people come to pick up hogs and they have a cattle trailer with, with cow shit in it that the pigs go right for it. So, I mean, it, and it, it might have something to do with some of the undigested, undigested grains in the, you know, if that's a, a grained animal that they're going to be passing through a lot of grains where I, a grass-fed, grass-fed cattle may not have the same thing in the, 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 the cow poop that the, the pigs would want. But I'm, I'm, no, I'm no expert on that. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. Not nearly as nervous today. Might have been the. You did a great job, Ryan. Thank you. 